scripture reading today will be Matthew 13, verses 44 through 46. I'm going to read the right scriptures this week. Y'all there? Matthew 13 and 44. I'll be reading from the King James Version. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man, seeking goodly pearls, who when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and bought it. The Lord add a blessing to his word. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Through many dangerous toils and snares, we have already come. To this place we come at the end of a week where uh, you have all been through many journeys that are personal to you and probably many dangerous toils and snares, some of which you know about, some of which you don't know about. I was out in a, a river uh, on Thursday, uh, a friend of mine was chest deep in water and we were hunting for shark's teeth. And, uh, he was in the, in the pool of water, and he had been there for probably half an hour when I came up with my kayak and sort of threw my leg over the kayak and looked at him, asked him how he was doing, we chatted for a little bit, we talked about what he was finding, and I looked over in the corner of the pool, and I stared, and uh, he's talking away, and I'm staring corner of the pool. He's in the pool, chest deep in water, in the corner of the pool up against, up against the bank. I'm looking at something. It doesn't look quite right. I'm staring. So he eventually stops talking. He follows my gaze. And there in the corner of the pool is an alligator. It's probably only about maybe eight yards from him. And uh, it wasn't very big. It was only about four feet. But uh, you know, that's uh, not the first experience with alligators that we've had, and uh, probably won't be the last, and so they're around. And um, you guys have all been through troubles and difficulties in your personal lives, uh, and the Lord has probably saved you more times than you realized this past Amen. week. So let's bow our heads. I'm going to ask His presence again to be here. Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you here with bowed heads, confessing our needs. Lord, there is no happiness or contentment apart from you on this earth. The only rest that we can have as individuals is to surrender to you. You call to us in our personal lives. Lord, sometimes we run away and disobey, go the other way. Father, thinking that we're going to have peace with whatever it is that we're chasing. Father, we have found in our personal lives that that is not the case. And that there's only rest and peace, rest and peace and comfort in you. Father, now we just bow our hearts and our minds to you and recognize that you are the sovereign of this earth. Lord, we recognize that you have paid this enormous price for each one of us. We're going to talk about here this, that here this morning. We pray that your spirit will be here with us. In Jesus' name. It's funny that Mary Jane's uh, story this morning was to do with Pitcairn Island and the mutiny on the bounty because the story that I'm going to tell you here at the beginning of my talk is about 
that same general time period, the age of adventure, the age of exploration. And in the modern world today, it's like wonder has run out. You go on Google Maps, you can see everything in the whole world. You know how to navigate from here to there. You can get anything that you need. It's at your fingertips, at the drugstore, at the supermarket. You need a new car, you go get a new car, right? You need, a, you need a new knee, you go get a knee at the doctor. Whatever it is you need, modern society has almost figured it out. And modern society has subdued the wild places of the earth to a great extent. But not too long ago, there was a time period when the world was an undiscovered place still. And gradually, humanity explored the earth, discovered America, discovered hidden places, but back in 1913 there were still places where it were unconquered. They were unseen. No human foot, so far as we know, had ever been there. And in 1913, one of the last places that was undiscovered and un unexplored was going to be explored. And several attempts had been made to cross Antarctica and been unsuccessful. People had failed, people had died, vast sums of money had been spent, the glory of empires was at stake. And in 1913, a man who had been on expeditions before by the name of Ernest Shackleton determined that he was going to mount an expedition to Antarctica. And if you know about what was happening in 1913, 1914, the world was a tumultuous place. World War I was about to break out. And so it was in this atmosphere of contention, growing global tension, that Shackleton decided that he was going to raise an expedition to go and do what he had failed to do before and what others had failed to do before. And so he went and he petitioned the former uh, former politicians and former mayors and present mayors and famous people and he tried to raise money but again it was difficult times and at first um, the, the uh, response was tepid at best but gradually he raised the money he anticipated that at that point in time he needed about 60,000 pounds these are English pounds which is, uh, in today's currency is somewhere around uh, probably about five million dollars to do this expedition. And he decided that what he was going to do was he was going to have two ships. One ship would carry him and about 20 men. They would land at the edge of Antarctica and another ship would come from the other side from Australia. So if you, if you look at Antarctica on the map, you can see it there at the bottom of the world Australia is nearby, and, south, and the southern tip of South America is nearby. And his plan was to bring a ship from South America to the tip of Antarctica here, and a ship from, from Australia, and that second ship was going to go across to the middle of Antarctica and lay a trail of supplies. Because it's freezing temperatures, it is literally the hardest environment on the earth. It is the most hostile place imaginable which is why it was unexplored. And they were going to lay supplies from the middle of the island, the continent, to the edge, so that the men who were coming from the other side would have something to eat and so that they would not die in the middle of Antarctica. And legend has it that when Shackleton was assembling his crew, he took a newspaper ad out and it said this, Men wanted for hazardous journey, low wages, bitter cold, long hours of complete darkness, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in event of success. <laughs> and if you know anything about Antarctica, the poles of this planet, they are enveloped in darkness for months out of the year, where the sun never comes above the horizon. And this is the days where there is no infrastructure whatsoever. 
There's not going to be any electricity whatsoever. It's 1913. Electricity has been discovered, but it's not like they have the ability to, to harness it at that point in time in this place, in this environment. And so he began to assemble a, a crew, and 5,000 people apparently answered this ad. And he whittled it down to about 28. There were three women uh, who applied um, as well. And he assembled a crew, and he was missing a captain. And there was a man by the name of Frank Worsley, who had, uh, he had developed um, a reputation in the Army and in the Navy, for being a tremendous navigator. And he could find little specks out in the middle of the ocean. And he could navigate unerringly to them. And so the night that Shackleton uh, was about to finalize his crew, he was still missing a captain, Frank Worsley says that he had a dream. And in, a dr in his dream in London, he was navigating icebergs on Burlington Avenue in downtown London. And he woke up, and he went down to Burlington Avenue, and there was a sign outside of a window for hire, crew for Antarctica expedition. And Worsley went in and spoke with Ernest Shackleton for a little while, and Shackleton hired him on the spot to be the captain of the ship that was called the Endurance. They set sail in 1914 from England, and they went to Argentina. And on the way there, World War I had broken out, but they were told to proceed anyways. And on the way there, um, the Endurance stopped in a place called Madeira, and it was neutral territory that was neither for the Germans and, and, uh, and, and their army and their war effort, and it wasn't for the British and their war, uh, war effort. And so it was neutral territory. And the Endurance was moored in the harbor. And this German ship came by and hit it and damaged it. And Worsley was so enraged that he took a group of his men and he boarded the German ship like they were a bunch of pirates <laughs> and forced the Germans to repair the Endurance right there in the harbor. So that's the kind of men who you were dealing with back then. Amen. Amen. All right? <laughs> I'm here to tell you, you rarely see a man like that these days. Amen. Now, the endurance launched from Argentina on December 5th, 1914. Three days later, it encountered ice on its way to what's called the Weddell Sea in Antarctica. Three days later, they are three days into the trip, and they encountered ice. And Shackleton said, he records in his journal, the journals, he thought, this is, you know, this is not what I expected. There was too much ice. And so they began to navigate in and around the ice, he weaving his way in and around these icebergs. But at various points as he continued, as the ship continued, they would get blocked by ice. The ice would surround them, and for days they would be trapped as just this ice drifted. And then it would open up, or they would blast their way free with dynamite, or they would dig their way out, and they would continue on. Until finally they hit a spot where there was clear sailing, and they made clear steaming for about two weeks, whereupon they got surrounded by ice again. Now, December 5th, 1914, I want you to listen to these dates. This was their trip. February 15th, okay, that's two and a half months later. You're aboard a ship, you're headed to Antarctica, you're not even there yet, two and a half months go by. We can barely go from Castleberry to New Smyrna Beach in my truck with my wife. <laughs> okay? <laughs> because she's like, it's the truck rattles and it, you know, um, you know, and she gets claustrophobic and things like that. I just just imagine what it's like to be in a ship for two and a half months. Okay? Sailing to the bottom of the earth. 
February 15, 1915, they are stuck in the ice permanently. The ship is surrounded with ice. It is pressed on every side. They cannot break free. Months pass. March, April, May, June, July. Okay. Through the dark. Right? Those are the dark hours of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the year. Dark days of the year. They're in pitch darkness. And the idea was to take a dog sled team to the middle of Antarctica. So they've got, you know, 50 dogs in the boat with them, in this ship. And they're in the middle of the dark for months on end. Shackleton kept thinking that the ice would disperse and that he would be able to continue sailing. You know, other people had gone through this similar experience. Eventually it'll clear, the summer will come, everything will be fine, the ice will disperse. It never happened. Eight months they were trapped in that ice. Whereupon, one day, the ice pressed so closely around the ship that it began to cave the sides in. They're there at the bottom of the world, and the, the sides of the ship are creaking. And when the beams are exploding, they sound like gunshots. And the water starts to come in. And they're pumping furiously down there at the bottom of the world. There's no way to call for help. There's no cell phones. There's no satellite phones. There's no GPS. And they're down there at the bottom of the world and their ship is filling with water. And Shackleton, according to his logs, gave the order to abandon ship on October 27, 1915. They had been in that ship since February 15. Stuck. On the death, on the, when they abandoned ship, the ice kept the ship afloat in the air, in the in the in the on top of the ice, so it did not sink underneath. And all their supplies were in the ship, and so gradually they went into the ship and they took them out onto the ice, and they established camp on the ice. And they had been rationing food and hardtack and whatever else that sailors ate in 1915. I'm sure it wasn't pretty. And they put it out on the ice and they established camp. And they were out there November, December, January, February, March, April, living on the ice with their supplies. And Supplies were growing thin, as you can imagine. And they were living, at the beginning, seal meat was a luxury. Soon seal meat was just about all they had. And they would go out on these expeditions to try and fish or catch something. And it was perilous because the ice was shifting and they were out walking around on it and you could easily get lost in the ice. <clears throat> One day, as a man was coming back, a leopard seal, I don't know if any of you know what that is, it's this big monstrous seal that's like 15 feet long, and it eats other seals. It's, it's like you think seal, that's like this cute fluffy thing with whiskers and little eyes and you want to kiss it. This is like 15 feet with big teeth and it eats everything. And it came up out of the ice behind one of these men who was on a hunting expedition, and it chased this man across the ice until they shot it and ate it. And that was what their life was like. In April, they abandoned the ice because people were getting sick and their, their health was deteriorating. And Shackleton recognized that it was impossible to go over to Antarctica and hit the spot where he was hoping to get to and, and get new supplies and things like that. It was impossible. And so the order was made to load the boats. Supplies. And the boats that they had had been constructed as lifeboats to certain specifications. My canoe is 16 feet long. These lifeboats, we can put four people in my canoe, three people plus me. 
you know, and, and take it to the river and it won't sink. Okay, these boats are six feet bigger. They're 22 and a half feet long. You divide 28 men in between three boats. So you've got, what's the map? Seven men, right? So you got, you got way, these boats are way over capacity. And they launch out, they launch out to try and get to a spot called Elephant Island. And Elephant Island is this barren, inhospitable, vacated piece of rock out in the middle of this ocean. And the temperatures are minus 15, and they are navigating without a GPS, like I said. They're using old instruments that, are, that were used back in the days of seafaring men. And they have to take measurements using the horizon and the stars, and it's overcast and it's stormy. And if you miss Elephant Island, you end up in the middle of nowhere. And so they're relying on Worsley to get them to Elephant Island. I have to look at my dates here. This part of my, my notes didn't get, uh, didn't get printed out, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, actually it did. All right. Um, One of the ships was called the Dudley Docker, which was named after one of their uh, main uh, benefactors who had funded the trip. And Worsley, it is said, captained the Dudley Docker at, when they were approaching this pivotal point in their journey when they needed to get to Elephant Island. It, it was, it was uh, a significant journey of something like uh, 300 miles from where they left on the ice to Elephant Island. And Worsley stayed in the top of the, of the mast on this 22 and a half foot boat and he called down instructions to the people in the bottom. And according to his diaries, he was awake for 90 hours straight as he navigated because he knew that if he missed a measurement, right, and you never knew when the sun was going to come up or when the stars would show a little bit because everything was gloomy and overcast and stormy. He knew that if he missed a measurement, everybody could die because they were relying on him. And when Worsley was finally relieved of the captaincy for a little bit of time of the Dudley Docker, as they could see Ele Elephant Island and they knew that they were going to make it to the island, he immediately fell asleep in the bottom of the boat. And as they were navigating into the island, it was, there were some treacherous spots and they needed to wake him up and they could not wake him up. They yelled at him, they shook him, the only way that they could wake him up was repeated kicks to the head. Oh. And Worsley did not find out about this till later. So it tells you what kind of men you're dealing with. They made, they made landfall on Elephant, Elephant Island. 28 men who had left the endurance, not a man lost to this point. Wow. They'd been out there for a year and a half. And, and um, you know, morale was fairly, fairly good because Shackleton was, you know, uh, he, was, he was a real optimist. And he kept everybody's spirits up. But I mean, I'm sure that there were dark times during the last year and a half, right? You can't stay on Elephant Island. There's nothing there. You're going to die. And so Shackleton knows that he has to go get help. Help, you're down in Antarctica, right? Now you're on Elephant Island, right? Help, the closest help is 800 miles away in South Georgia. Nobody knows where they are. It's storm season. And so Shackleton gets together with a few of the men and he says, we're going to take one of these boats and we're going to sail it 800 miles to South Georgia. And it's through one of the most inhospitable, angry places on earth where the sea is just, it's always a raging, foaming disaster. And it's storm season. And they're going to take this boat that's not much bigger than my canoe with five men in it and they're going to sail at 800 miles to see if they can get help. And Shackleton took four weeks of uh, work, weeks worth of food because he knew that if 
he hadn't hit South Georgia in four weeks, they would be dead anyways, and so he didn't need any more food than that. And so they, they repaired this boat as best they could, and fortified it, and they set sail to South Georgia. I just picture this, five men in a boat, 800 miles. I know people in Florida who haven't been 800 miles out of Florida in their entire life. You know, they don't, they've never been to the places that are beyond, and that's in a car or a bus. This is 800 miles in this little boat. It's minus 15 degrees. These are tough guys. These are tough guys. And ice kept forming around the edges of the boat, even with the salt content in the water. And it, was, it made the boat very, very hard to steer and navigate, and it made it heavy in the water and lively to capsize. And so a man had to hang himself out over the edge of the boat and break away the ice. And they would hang on to him while the pitch, while the boat is moving like this. And on May 5th, Shackleton and the four men in the boat with him hit a hurricane. And Shackleton said they were the biggest waves that he had ever seen in his life in 26 years of being on the sea. And the boat is going up, I mean, these are big waves, 40, 50 feet in the air, right? 40, from the pitch to the trial, I don't know how big these waves are, but they're big, right? If they're the biggest he's ever seen. You know, 40 feet down, 40 feet up, 40 feet down, 40 feet up. And wor Worsley, in this environment, is, is navigating with his chronometer and his sextant. And he's taking measurements of the horizon, and the horizon is doing this. Right? And it's dark and it's stormy and they're in a hurricane. And Worsley, again, he knows that if they miss South Georgia, they will sail into the Atlantic and nobody will ever hear from them again because there's nothing out there. And all the men on Elephant Island will die and everybody in the ship would die. And there would be no story. Well, the story would be Shackleton and these guys went down to Antarctica and never came back. Shackleton and those men made it to the south side of South Georgia. The men were in such condition after this trip that they couldn't sail around. The winds were adverse, the storms, they, they saw the land. They put the, the ship on a beach after several days of laying off the island in the storm. The storm was too big for them to get even to the, to the land. They had to throw the anchor and just sit there and ride it out. They finally made it to the beach, and Shackleton and two men, Worsley and, um, and another fellow, said, we're going to go for help. There was a whaling station at the far side of the island. It was 35 miles from that beach to the other side of the mile. And South Georgia is a land of cliffs and waterfalls and glaciers, and it's the most inhospitable land you could possibly imagine. You just think about this story, it just, it just, it just gets worse and worse. <laughs> 35 miles, they've been shipwrecked for a year and three quarters almost at this point in time. They hadn't had a normal meal, they hadn't had a shave, they hadn't had a bath. They hadn't had a good night's sleep in a, in a nice warm bed. And they launch out across this island. They've got no, they've got their map at that point in time does not show what is between them and the whaling station. Because it only shows the outside of the island, because that's all people are interested in, because nobody wants to cross this island. <laughs> and they get into the island. And they have to repeatedly turn around because they get to cliffs, they get to glaciers, they get to crevasses, they, get, they can't cross. They go up and they go down and they're trying to find their way and they're climbing with their ice axes up the sides of these mountains. Right? These are massive, jagged mountains. And they get to a spot where, if you, you read about this in the book called Endurance, 
which was the name of the ship. Incidentally, it was also Shackleton's family motto, by endurance we conquer. They got to a spot where...